We are live and attendees are coming in. Great, thank you, Lee. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. This event is uh, being recorded and so people are gonna be checking into it uh, as we go. And I think we have another panelist that's trying to break her way back in. Um, but I want to thank Lee for putting the panel together tonight and welcome our esteemed panel for tonight's event, Fighting Back Lessons from AIDS for COVID. My name is Terry Beswick and I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. Our host tonight is the GLBT Historical Society, founded in 1985, the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender uh, Historical Society, collects, preserves, exhibits, and makes accessible to the public materials and knowledge to support and promote understanding of LGBTQ history, culture, and arts in all their diversity. Our operations are centered around two sites, our GLBT Historical Society Museum in the Castro and the John DeCecco Archives and Research Center, open to researchers in the mid-market neighborhood of San Francisco. And while both of our facilities are currently closed, we are open for business and online. And I encourage everybody to check out our exhibitions and our events like this one and uh, archival resources that we're working really hard to move online at uh, glbthistory.org. And I also just want to make a quick pitch for our membership drive for the month of June. We are running specials so you can support GLBT history uh, at best $35 for the whole year. And it gets you all these cool benefits like discounts on hoodies and whatnot. Um, so please check it out, glbthistory.org. Um, so the Fighting Back series, we started this a few years ago uh, in the wake of the inauguration of Donald Trump. Um, we were all, of course, feeling overwhelmed and discouraged and looking for a way to connect history with the growing resistance movement. And so over the last few months, we've given a special focus to various aspects of the COVID epidemic and looking at uh, the COVID epidemic through the lens of AIDS and sorting out ways, lessons that we can learn from AIDS that can be applied to the current pandemic. So tonight's uh, forum, uh, we're going to be talking about a narrow topic area, um, the testing, contact tracing, and quarantine issues. So in the early years of the HIV epidemic, mandatory testing, contact tracing, and quarantine were hot button issues, rife with implications for civil rights, particularly given that the disease targeted marginalized groups already struggling for equal protections under the law. As with COVID-19, politics often threatened to trump public health science, and while mandatory quarantine of AIDS patients had to be defeated at the ballot box in California in the 1980s, testing became a core prevention tool and contact tracing also gained scientific support. So how do these experiences translate to COVID? What are the implications for testing, contact tracing, and quarantine for civil rights and disease prevention? So we've put together a fantastic panel tonight. Um, it seems to be, yeah, we've got five on here and I think there's a six that will be joining us as soon as we work out some technical issues. So I just want to like um, uh, briefly go around and introduce everybody and then go around again and ask each of you to just talk a little bit about your work in relationship to AIDS, COVID, and in particular with contact tracing and testing and quarantine. Um, and to start out with, uh, uh, we're gonna hear in a bit from Abdul Ali Muhammad, who's a Philadelphia-based organizer and writer. They are a co-founder of the Black and Brown Workers Co-op, a Black-led queer organization focused on workers' rights and displacement politics. Welcome, Abdul Ali. And Matt Coles, who hung out a shingle and practiced law in the Castro in 1978 and later headed the ACLU's HIV project, has worked on LGBTQ rights and HIV issues for most of his life. He is now a professor at the University of California Hastings College of Law. Welcome, Matt. Ernest Hopkins is an old friend. He leads the San Francisco AIDS Foundation national policy and legislative activities at the federal, administrative, and congressional levels. Ernest marked 20 years at the AIDS Foundation in 2017, having led federal policy and legislative activities since 1997. John Jacobo, uh, welcome John, he's a longtime activist who's worked for racial justice and housing rights, both in the community and at City Hall. John is the chair of the Latino Task Force COVID-19 Committee, currently working on the COVID testing campaigns in the mission, and most recently in the Bayview and Visitation Valley Sunnydale neighborhoods of San Francisco. Diane Jones is an HIV nurse, 
Welcome, Don Young. Uh, she's an HIV nurse and worked at the San Francisco General Hospital from 1982 until her retirement in 2016. She currently chairs or works with the Getting to Zero Consortium and is a volunteer with the Latina Task Force COVID-19 Committee. Tim Walfred, also an old friend, um, he, was, he was the establishment um, when I got involved in AIDS activism in the mid 1980s. He's a lifelong community activist. He was executive director of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation from 1985 to 1989. In 1980, he was the first openly gay person to be elected to the San Francisco Community College Board of Trustees where he served four terms. So that's a lot. Uh, thanks for bearing with me as I just introduce everybody with these very brief uh, summaries of their lives. Um, and there's a lot more that they can say, of course. Um, but uh, I thought we we're going to go around the room, I think, to just give everyone a chance uh, to talk a little bit about whatever you want to talk about. But in particular, I want to like make space for everyone to talk about the current Black Lives Matter movement as it is uh, a movement calling for an end to racial injustice um, and white supremacy and police brutality. And these issues are, of course, related to civil rights, which is related to uh, the, a lot of the factors related to COVID-19 and AIDS, of course. Um, and so there's a lot to unpack there, but I just want to make space for everyone to address those issues, which are very prominent in our thinking right now. Um, so if I could, um, Abdul Ali, if, could we start with you um, and just hear a little bit about your work and your thinking? Oh, I'm going to mute myself because my dog just started yapping. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me, Terry. Um, so I guess I'll start a little bit with um, some biographical information. I'm from Philly, grew up in West Philadelphia. I tested positive for HIV in 2008, December. And um, I worked in HIV prevention for six and a half years, um, including research, um, including uh, um, a position as a coordinator for a CDC directed program for social networks testing, um, and also as an HIV prevention counselor. So, um, PAWS worked in prevention for some years. I've been organizing full time for over four years. Um, I co-founded the Black and Brown Workers Cooperative with Shani Akila and Dominique London. Um, and, and that was because of the, the white dominant society, social um, structure of aid service organizations in Philadelphia. So we wanted to address anti-blackness, um, transphobia um, at th those institutions. And that's where the Black and Brown Workers Collective, now cooperative, was, um, was formed um, and why it was formed. Um, I think a lot and talk a lot about surveillance, um, specifically medicalized surveillance of POS people, more, um, I guess, more specifically Black um, LGBTQ folks um, in the ways that we're policed for being PAS. Um, I wrote a piece in Race Beta recently discussing um, surveillance and uh, what it means for COVID-19, what it has meant for PAS people, especially Black and Brown PAS people. Um, we know that um, HIV disproportionately impacts Black and Brown folks. We also know that HIV criminalization laws um, impact disproportionately Black and Brown folks. So I think it, it does relate to your question about how, to, how does the current moment tie into HIV. I think that was the question of how Black Lives Matter kind of ties into this narrative around HIV and COVID. I think it's interlocked um, and interlinked because of the, the disparity um, that is caused by the systems of oppression we, we we name all the time, right? White supremacy um, and so on and so forth. Um, and in the article I wrote recently, I talk about how for, the, for states to get access to HIV dollars, um, when Ryan White Care Act was passed, um, they, had to, they had to pass legislation to criminalize people for non-disclosure. 
Um, and the organization that was behind that um, template language was ALEC, A-L-E-C. And ALEC was the same organization responsible for stand your ground laws that we saw in Florida, which is the law that allowed George Zimmerman to get off for killing a black child, right? So this same organization, ALEC, that was responsible for this template language recently was also the same organization that pushed HIV criminalization laws. Um, so there is a, a direct connection. Um, and then I also talk about the, the ways that the systems create archetypes uh, or pathologies um, of Black people. Um, specifically, I used um, the welfare queen archetype, right? The idea that Black women, especially, were trying to gouge the system of resources, um, and that allowed states and the federal government to kind of um, enact laws that would further surveil and police the actions around access to subsidies um, and how that was used to criminalize um, poor people, um, that, that narrative. And I think about this in the context of contact tracing because we know that is partner services, right? In Philadelphia, for example, partner services is the, the, the health department kind of trying to find folks who um, may not know they're positive, right? And they kind of use the model of uh, like following the social network of the person who tested positive. Um, and the ways that they move through um, Philly, for example, is, is, um, is kind of akin to police, right? They kind of pop, jump out of white vans. Um, they sometimes get uh, descriptions of people if they don't get names. So they kind of show up at different places and address folks and try to figure out, are you so-and-so? You might have been exposed to X, Y, and Z. And um, we know what that does um, to Black people when Black folks have folks coming into the community, sometimes not from the community, often not from the community, trying to address their um, critical health needs. Um, it doesn't bode well for um, the folks who they are targeting or trying to help. Um, and so I, I am concerned, right, that this idea of hiring all these contact tracers for uh, figuring out the social networks um, that are impacted by COVID-19, we will see the same kind of policing, the same kind of overstep into communities that people are not familiar with. Um, so I just want to highlight that. And I think that's sufficient to, to start off the combo. I'm so glad that we started with you, Abdulali. Thank you very much. Those you brought up a lot of great topics, and I'm sure we're going to circle back to those. Um, Matt, can you talk to us for a bit about your work? Sure. Um, uh, well, as you mentioned in that very kind introduction, um, I uh, hung out a shingle and started practicing law on Castro Street in the late 1970s, so just before um, HIV hit. Um, I think I had four main involvements in working on HIV over the years. Um, I was the uh, legal counsel to uh, the, the opposition to the three big initiatives, which would have created <clears throat> probably at a minimum contact tracing, but probably quarantine of people with HIV. We had two in 1986 and one in 1988. Um, maybe more important, I helped put together a lot of the uh, original litigation aimed at trying to get federal civil rights protection for people with HIV, mainly emphasizing cases involving prisons um, and healthcare workers. Um, I was actually involved in, and we may come back to this later, the crafting of California's, at first quite unique, but uh, ultimately adopted by a lot of places, anonymous testing system, which allowed people with HIV to get tested and not have their names reported to anybody. It was a, kind of a, a really interesting political uh, storm that, that made it possible for us to, to put that together, um, which Tim knows a lot about too. Um, and then finally, uh, I did I kept my law practice in the Castro until 1987 when I went to the American Civil Liberties Union. And so I was dealing kind of day in and day out with a lot of the practical problems that went along um, uh, with HIV, with people, you know, getting, getting sick, um, uh, frequently, uh, far too often, 
uh, having families uh, find out uh, for the first time that uh, they had a kid who was gay and who was uh, dying or, or going to be dead or had just died um, and dealing with uh, the, 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 essentially the consequences, and I think this is important to our topic tonight, that um, HIV at that time was essentially confined in the 80s in San Francisco, was essentially confined to um, mostly to gay men and um, a not casually transmissible disease, unlike COVID-19. Um, that meant if you got discovered as having um, AIDS, that was a problem, or HIV, that was a problem in itself, um, given the way people were afraid of HIV, but it also marked you, um, and later on marked you as either gay or an IV drug user or both. Um, and, you know, to just, and I'm sure most of the people here are, are well aware of this, but, you know, throughout the 1980s, there was only one state in the country that banned job discrimination against LGBT people, and that was Wisconsin, not California, um, not New England. Um, there were 14 states that made any kind of sexual relations between people of the same sex a crime. And in the middle of the, uh, uh, the 80s, the U.S. Supreme Court said that that was okay constitutionally. And so... You know, the, the, the context here is so different from COVID, I think, in the sense that COVID's casually transmissible. The entire population of the country is at risk of getting the illness. With AIDS, that was very different. And AIDS could become a marker, not only for the existence of the disease itself, um, but for other folks. With uh, AIDS, we were talking about um, uh, mass testing. We were um, really talking, the only mandatory testing we had was for blood banks. We were really talking about trying to encourage people to get testing so that they could take care of themselves and 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 minimize the uh, minimize the spread. The other thing that's really different is the kind of contact tracing we're talking about today is totally different than the kind of old-fashioned public health contact tracing we were talking about in the 80s. Contact tracing, even if it's called mandatory in the old public health system, was essentially a voluntary thing. You sat down with a social worker and you told them who you'd had contact with. And when we're talking about a disease like HIV or, uh, or Hep B, um, Hep C rather, um, which are not casually transmissible, it was pretty easy to, to do that if you wanted to, but there was no way to force you to do it if you didn't want to. Now we're talking about virtually any kind of contact. And so the kind of contact tracing we're talking about is trying to use phones and other devices in order to see everywhere that somebody's been in contact with. So A, if government gets access to that kind of data, it's not really essentially a voluntary system anymore. And B, it tells you all sorts of things um, about the people whose information is being gathered. And so, so what I would say is that <clears throat> while I think the testing and contact tracing issues are really different, the lessons from, uh, from HIV AIDS um, uh, are in some ways the same, which is you create a situation in which information could be used to oppress people who are already quite frightened and already quite oppressed. Um, and you drive people away from the public health system if you do that. And real unguarded contact tracing, I think, would threaten to do much the same thing. I think people would uh, turn off their phones, would stop cooperating with public health, and would make the uh, epidemic much worse. So in some ways, the dynamic lesson of AIDS and HIV I think is um, a lesson that, that, that we need to take forward. And let me just say one last thing on, on, on where we are in the country today. Um, I was telling somebody earlier today that, that, that after the depression of last week, um, uh, and this may just be uh, me, I feel more optimistic um, about whether we may some, see some real change in this country than I have in a very, very, very long time. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, a lot, a lot there too that I hope we can circle back to. Let's see. I have Ernest next on my list. How are you doing, Ernest? Great. I, I was, I was hoping to hear from Diane. I was, uh, I, <laughs> I wanted all of the griots uh, who had all of the knowledge of San Francisco to speak first, so um, that I could first of all learn, but uh, second of all, um, bring a perspective from the East Coast, which is um, the one I bring from the early days. So, you know, I'm from Washington, D.C. and uh, did a lot of my early HIV work in New York City. I was uh, 
at Columbia at the time that the, the epidemic broke out and was a buddy at GMHC and um, then left the country for a while, came back to Washington where in the early, in the late 80s, early 90s, the epidemic was exploding in the black community, but still not perceived as a black problem. And uh, the stigma associated with HIV and as Matt said, the implications thereof that you were then branded as, as gay or uh, injection drug user uh, were huge in a city like Washington, which is at its core very conservative today, much less uh, back in 1980s or 90s. Um, and uh, for folks who worked in the government, it was a very dangerous and risky thing to, um, to have those kinds of association. And so, I fell into uh, volunteer work trying to assist folks who were losing their, their uh, livelihoods, who were losing their homes, who uh, were in need of emergency assistance. And in an effort to uh, raise money for emergency assistance, we created uh, a an event in Washington called uh, Black Gay and Lesbian Pride, which has uh, now turned into uh, international uh, federation of pride days that have moved all around the world um, appropriately now focused more on disability and just um, ownership of a person's sexual orientation and identity but at the time it was completely practically focused on raising resources for uh, black folks who were living in in uh, in Washington D.C. Remember, this is before 1990 uh, and the passage of Ryan White, uh, and so there were no federal resources in the community to actually address the um, social service and uh, palliative care needs of people living with HIV. Um, I then got very involved in politics there, and what really became very clear to me is the connection between COVID and HIV is what a tragedy it is that both testing, um, which is a public health tool, and contact tracing, which is also a public health tool designed to promote public health, have been so um, turned on their heads into these uh, tactics to marginalize, criminalize, uh, ostracize, um, it really is almost, um, if you really think about it, uh, almost genocidal, the ways in which these really important public health tools have been used in both instances to keep really essential information uh, from the very people who need it the most. Uh, and in the black community, both um, in the 90s and now, the notion of vaccine, the notion of trusting public health is really um, challenging. No one, it, it, it can't be a surprise to anyone that um, there is deep skepticism about uh, the likelihood that anything that comes uh, from this administration is actually going to have a benefit to black, uh, and, black and brown people. And so um, I worry that in this moment where it took us a very long time, way too long in the, H in the early days of HIV to, to understand the impact of HIV on Black and Latinx communities. Now we know immediately because of social media and all of the other platforms, the impact, the disproportionate impact that it's having on Native communities, Latinx, Black communities, and so these communities are desperate for solutions. They're desperate for resources. They're desperate for support. And in order to get that support, they're going to need to, to be identified. And so once again, this very important essential public health tool that should be being used to their benefit is once again being used in a way that marginalizes and um, keeps them away from the very resources that they're going to need in order to save their lives. It is, in fact, genocidal. And um, I don't want to give anybody credit for being that uh, evil and that smart about it. Um, but the impact is the same, regardless of whether it was completely intentional or not. 
there will be people all across the country when a vaccine is created, they will not uh, be willing to believe that it is for them. When they need to have their contacts traced and to know who potentially needs to be tested in order to uh, get them the support that they need, they will not give up the information. And when it's time to get tested, they won't go to get tested until they are symptomatic. And we know that in black and brown communities that people who have gone to get uh, testing at, when they're symptomatic, that is a very problematic um, situation for them. And we see the morbidity that's associated with, with that um, all across the country. And so, you know, as I think about the connection, the linkages, the most positive thing I can say, and I'll end on this, is that at least we have the community-based organizations and tools um, that were born and created out of HIV to now use um, for, a, a, for the COVID response. Um, we know what to do. We know how to do it. And I think that the the ways in which some of our communities are doing the contact tracing, making sure that the um, tracers are indigenous to the community, that they speak the language, that they know the people, um, that may in fact mitigate to a certain extent the damage um, that our national response has done to the, these populations. But it's just another example of, of the, the ways in which race and class um, have such a damaging uh, after aftershock on what should be common public health practices when the the overlay of racism and discrimination are put onto it it undermines our best efforts to um, do the best things that we can do for people then and now great uh, thank you so much Ernest it's a uh, uh, um a lot of a lot of great stuff there that I'm I'm hoping that everyone else will uh, revisit and touch on as well. Um, uh, John, uh, I think I have you next on the list. Yes, John Jacobo. Uh, I've been so inspired by your project, and I'm really looking forward to hearing you talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, good afternoon. When I started this, everybody, or good evening. Uh, my name is John Jacobo, um, and uh, I have the good fortune of being born about five blocks from where I currently am today here in. Uh, El Barrio La Misión, the San Francisco Mission District. Um, you know, I, I always joke that I stumbled into the line of work that I'm in currently, and I think many of us probably could relate. Um, but, you know, it is this, um, this yearning and this want for me, uh, and I've been able to boil it down a little bit more succinctly as, as the years have gone on. Um, you know, all I think that I truly would like to see, and for many of us, um, it's not that we want mansions. It's not that we want people to give us Rolls Royces. We just want fairness. We just want equity. We want dignity. We want respect. Uh, and we want to be treated uh, like those of privilege uh, and how they are treated. Um, and so that is kind of been the, the path, I suppose, that I've been slowly stumbling down and working through. Um, and I have the good fortune of wearing a few different hats. Um, and as you've alluded to, I, I've had the privilege of, of working in uh, City Hall as a legislative aide for former supervisor Jane Kim. Um, and here in community, I served as a vice president for Calle 24, the Latino Cultural District. Um, and, you know, we are members of a very amazing group uh, that was born out of uh, the reaction to COVID. Um, you have to pardon me, my, my iPad is dying, so I have to change venues here in a minute. And by that is moving it to my left. Um, we we're part of the Latino Task Force uh, for COVID-19 um, and understanding that our community was going to be afflicted um, and not necessarily maybe having the foresight to understand that it would be through the health side of it as, uh, as, the, as we now see with the level of impact, but thinking in terms of those that would lose jobs, thinking in terms of those that would not be able to put food on the table. And so I'm blessed to have a array of organizers and leaders above me in, in the terms of elders uh, here in community that um, put a group of us together and we've all kind of been working towards trying to fix some of these problems. And a big part of that has led me uh, to be the chair of our health committee 
um, and be chairing the UCSF uh, Latino Task Force Joint Project that took place here in the Mission District alongside the amazing uh, Dion Jones, who's a bestie of mine now. We've become very close and attached at the hip practically. Um, and so that's a little bit of the work that I do. I know we'll have some questions and, and I really look forward to uh, learning a lot from all the fellow panelists and uh, engaging in a good conversation. Thank you, John and Dion. So that's a great segue into hearing from you. Um, so you were already involved with the Getting uh, to Zero Coalition and how did you get involved in the, the Latino uh, task force? Oh, I'm sorry, we need that. There we go. I just unmuted. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, um, I was approached by uh, Dr. Diane Havler, who is, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. So I was approached by Dr. Diane Havler, who's the chief of HIV infectious disease and global medicine at San Francisco General. And, um, who I've been working with. She was my boss up until I retired. Uh, and the last 10 years, I worked uh, coordinating the expanded HIV testing and linkage to care at San Francisco General. And then as part of that, worked on the Getting to Zero Consortium. So she approached me, gosh, I mean, John, you and I have been together almost every day now for I don't know how long, but really it wasn't that long ago when you think about when this hit. Um, because um, all, of her, all of her physicians are all the infectious disease doctors at San Francisco General, and they came to her and said, almost 87, close to 90% of the patients hospitalized at San Francisco General with COVID were uh, Latino Latinx of the Latinx community. And, uh, and all these doctors uh, who run Ward 86 and the HIV program at San Francisco General have worked with Diane Havler uh, in this very long longitudinal HIV testing study in East Africa and Southern Africa that really um, did mass community testing by partnering and collaborating with community uh, community, oftentimes very rural communities, and offering free HIV testing as part of a whole health fair, and then using that opportunity to link people to immediate uh, treatment for HIV. And then this longitudinal study repeated after several months and came back and watched how the rates of HIV transmission decreased dramatically by testing people, finding people who were HIV positive, getting them on treatment immediately, and, um, and helping them stay linked to care. So all these doctors at San Francisco General are watching this situation reproduce itself. Here we are again, what, 38 years after the HIV epidemic, and saying we need a search study in the mission because there's something happening and disproportionate uh, impact on communities. And by then, the, the data was really clear uh, nationally that black and brown communities were being disproportionately impacted. And so I was approached and because I live, I've lived in the mission for the last 40 years, my family, my daughter was born here, my grandkids are being raised here. All of us have been involved in mission organizations. I was asked to work with Diane to uh, find community partners in order to see if this is something that would be acceptable to the community. And then if it was to essentially make it happen. And so with you know one or two calls, I found the Latino task force. <laughs> Many of these people I know, they're, they know my family. We've in, been involved in multiple political campaigns together. We worked on the Jane Kim for Mayor campaign, et cetera. And um, many, there, would there was just a lot of overlap, which really helped kind of the trust factor. Um, because as we know, it's a challenge for communities, and this was absolutely true back in the beginning of the HIV epidemic. It's a challenge for communities to trust medical institutions. I mean, the, the, the literature, the hist our history is rampant with 
abuses, uh, bad research, uh, nefarious research, and uh, complicity of all sorts of people, nurses, doctors, community members, who really um, didn't truly understand what they, what they were getting into. And so we established this partnership and it was really an amazing partnership because it had to be forged over a very short period of time. This testing that we organized in the mission happened over um, really within three weeks of when we actually launched the organizing project. And we were essentially uh, wanting to create an opportunity to test people who were obviously impacted greatly by COVID, but had every single reason to not come forward and get tested for all sorts of reasons, starting with immigration status, understanding what was gonna happen, was their name gonna get given to the health department, how to create low barrier testing to people who, and, and get people to really trust that, this, that they would benefit from this. And we really took our leadership from the Latino task force. They were very clear about um, the, their misgivings or their, their uh, concerns about past um, interventions by the UCSF institution and the community where people come in, do research, take their data and leave and nothing comes back to the community. So they were savvy and really understanding under what conditions they were willing to do this. And, um, and we forged this amazing um, partnership. And over the space of, over the time of four days at the end of April, so April 25th to April 28th, at four testing sites in uh, a section of the mission, we tested over 4,000 people for COVID, uh, for COVID-19, both active disease and past disease. And getting these people out took a tremendous amount of work, as we know from our history around HIV, about how do you get, how, do, how are people going to trust? So back in the early days of HIV, what was the motivation to get tested? You know, it was automatic express lane to getting discriminated and targeted. There were no treatments available. What was the value? How could you convince people that it was necessary to get, to get tested? That changed when treatments became available, but we're in a similar situation with COVID. There are no treatments, right? And, um, and then there are consequences if you find out you're positive. Now, COVID, we think, is a short, limited, self-limiting uh, disease, and HIV is not. It's a lifelong infection that people have to live with and manage their whole lives. But there were enough, there were similarities that some of the approaches that, that we learned uh, through trial and error and a lot of errors that hurt a lot of people, predominantly people of color, through, a, through trial and error, we have learned some of the correct ways to do this. And our community partners really help guide this process. So at the end, 4,000 people are tested, okay? 38% of the people who were tested were white, zero people, zero white people tested positive. 46% of the people who tested were Latino, 95% of the people who tested positive were Latino. And then through research questions that were embedded in it, it was really clear that the risk factor was that white people and others were able to shelter in place and Latinos were not because they were essential workers <laughs> and they were coming out. They had to come out every day. They worked in the food and beverage industry. They worked in the construction industry and they were exposing themselves and putting themselves at risk in order to allow other people to shelter in place. And I think this kind of understanding um, is so critical in terms of understanding what what the interventions need to be because testing uh, contact tracing self-isolation these are the tools that are needed to stop this epidemic but they are not politically neutral <laughs> and they affect people disproportionately and so many interventions are required to number one make people test safely 
and shield them legally from consequences. And number two, that they can self quarantine and support their families in order to, to be able to recover and the, their families need access to testing as well. And, um, and then the coincidence with all of this happening in the backdrop of um, the mass movement against police brutality <clears throat> is um, there's a way that this, to me, the stars are sort of aligning is that if we can't get it and if we can't move on this, <laughs> Uh, this will be a tremendously lost opportunity because we've had many others in the past that we were not able to move around and understanding how much racial justice and social justice are so embedded in our principles of public health. Um, two pandemics are too, too many in a lifetime, but millions of people around the world are dealing with this, not just here, not just in the United States. and. Um, and so I think there's some really important lessons and I really thank you for bringing this group together and sharing that kind of wisdom um, to be able to bring our small part to this larger effort to really transform how public health and how healthcare is perceived. Thank you, Dion, and uh, thank you for all your work and your wisdom and um, Speaking of wisdom, uh, Tim Walford is the last uh, to give us some opening remarks. And then, you know, you guys are all doing my work for me. I actually had a whole list of questions and now I don't know what we're gonna talk about next, but be thinking about it. Uh, Tim, go ahead and talk to us. Okay, thank you, Terry. Um, I'm pleased to be on this panel. I'm quite humbled by the work that the other panelists have done and are still doing. I'm a little out of the game, as you might say, at this current point. A um, little bit more about my history. Prior to joining the AIDS Foundation in 1985, I was uh, head of men's services at Operation Concern, which is the outpatient uh, gay, lesbian uh, mental health services in San Francisco. And starting there in 81 and witnessing clients and others increasingly coming down with AIDS um, and becoming very concerned, I decided I wanted to jump much more into that arena and became executive director of the foundation. Uh, a lot of what I might say has already been said by others. Matt spoke to uh, the political battles we had to do continually to fight criminalization of HIV and people with HIV. The, Linda LaRouche tried twice to get us quarantined. Uh, William Dannemeyer did the same thing, a Republican congressman representing Orange County. Um, we uh, created our public policy department in 1987 because we saw that fighting the, the politics of this disease um, was central to our work. Uh, you know, we couldn't bring people in, uh, encourage testing if they knew that that was going to result in discrimination or maybe worse if LaRouche had, had succeeded. Um, so public policy and, and, and jumping into the politics of it became very central to our work. Um, the other thing I might comment on, um, oh, the other thing, the, the, the one parallel that occurs to me is safe sex and self-isolation. We had to sell to the gay community um, dropping some of their beloved sex practices. Um, and that wasn't easy initially. And it, but it was important that they hear it from peers. And it strikes me that that was a lot of our strategy was uh, being sure that there were peer groups talking to folks in all parts of the community, whether it was the black community, the Latin community, uh, Asian. Um, and we encouraged those groups. And when we set up the AIDS Walk in 1987, um, which was a major fundraiser, the first sort of major fundraiser that had been created in the city. We made sure that those funds came not only to us, but also to those organizations in other communities that were organizing for their constituencies as well around HIV prevention and care. Um, there was even a, a sex workers uh, coalition that uh, we actually incubated. They were in our offices and, and 
carried the messages out into their uh, peers. And, and I, it strikes me that that's what needs to be happening now uh, around COVID. It, as the Latino Project, the Latino Task Force that Dion and John have, have spoken to, um, that I think is, is the key strategy, is that each community needs to be organized to take on the disease in a way that fits for them. In, in the Latin community, immigration is a big issue and it, it has to be dealt with by other folks in that community. Um, and moving into areas like police violence, again, we talk about defunding the police as a strategy. And I think moving into community policing where each community has control, has a say on how they are policed and who polices them. Um, uh, and we take on so many of these issues that are now current. Uh, it seems to me that that strategy of empowerment of the community to take care of itself in ways that fit for it and for its cultures and for its history uh, is, is a, just a key strategy in my head um, going forward as we take them on. I don't have any much else to say. So much of it has been said by the others. And again, I appreciate that hearing from everyone. Thank you, Terry. Great, thanks, Tim. Um, really honored to have all of you here. Um, and there are a lot of different paths that we can take uh, to this conversation. My thinking was that we would start out um, kind of focusing in on uh, our experiences with HIV and AIDS. Um, and I do want to call out, of course, that the HIV AIDS epidemic is, is not over. Um, you know, we haven't succeeded in getting to zero in San Francisco, much less uh, throughout the world. Um, and uh, testing, uh, contact tracing and quarantine um, as tools, as public health tools, um, uh, you know, I, there, there may have been a, a point in time in, in, in the 1980s, and maybe Tim and Matt in particular, you can speak to this in Dion, um, where, you know, if, if you could do whatever you wanted to try to contain the HIV AIDS epidemic, uh, or utilizing testing and contact tracing and quarantine, uh, strictly from a public health perspective, you might have done X, Y, and Z. Uh, but these are living, breathing people um, with their pre-existing culture and their, their, uh, their history and their experiences. Um, and then there's the weight of the uh, discrimination and disenfranchisement that was, that was already occurring, at least in the LGBTQ community, and certainly among uh, brown and black people as well who were uh, uh, disproportionately affected by HIV and AIDS. So, so what was, can, can any of you like talk to me about the, what were, what, were the, what were the issues? And you spoke a little bit about this around the public uh, policy initiatives in California and, and nationally, the legal questions, but you know, what were the fears? Uh, and can you talk about those moments in history? What were the fears that people were experiencing around that? Um, uh, as they were struggling to deal with uh, the HIV and AIDS epidemic? Well, certainly the, the discrimination. Uh, if, to be identified with HIV, lose your job, um, uh, be alienated maybe from other friends, from family. Um, it was very important that we advocated for confidential testing and confidential uh, tracing uh, of contacts. Uh, a big part of the LaRouche initiative was that the, I think it was the LaRouche that the uh, testing results were going to a, a statewide registry. Um, and uh, who knows what could have been done with that. Uh, I mean, those were the big fears. Um, it was also, to be honest, you know, an, an HIV diagnosis was almost a death sentence at that point too. And uh, people avoided wanting, didn't want to know their status. Uh, there was no treatment as Dion was talking about. Um, and so uh, to stay in denial was a more comfortable place for, for a lot of people and to avoid the testing. Yeah, so what, you know, are, are you guys experiencing echoes of the AIDS epidemic when we start, when we talk about testing and trying to get out the testing uh, messages to people. Um, uh, 
Who, who's got PTSD on the panel here? <laughs> I don't feel it so much as PTSD, but um, there are some similarities and there are some tremendous differences. So some of the similarities is that when you think, so we're what, 100 days into this pandemic? Yeah. 100 days, right? Think about 100 days after the first MMWR article came out in 1981, right? What did we know 100 days after 1981 yes. when all of a sudden this mysterious disease had appeared? We didn't know anything and it took years to know. Yeah, the whole sense of time right. being, being condensed um, and also, uh, I mean, and part of it, and Abdul Ali referred to this as, I think, this, the, the social media, um, uh, you know, exponentially increases everyone's awareness of every snippet of news that comes along. Um, so there's that sort of acceleration uh, feeling that, that's happening. Uh, but it's also really amazing how quickly their, their research uh, and the collaboration is moving. Um, I can't imagine something like what you did in the mission, uh, John and Dion, uh, happening, you know, in, in 1981 or 82. Um, uh, of course, we didn't have the HIV test until 84, 85. So, you know, we didn't even know what we were talking about um, or how it was transmitted. So, you know, it, it, the comparisons, you know, fall apart very quickly. Um, Matt? Do you have anything to yeah. Can I um, speak to the PTSD question? Oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Abdul. Yeah, yeah. I I do I do think um, at minimum I am experiencing being triggered. I think I was talking to a friend of mine, Louis Ortiz. Louis Ortiz um, is a creator of a storytelling project called the Grand Verones Project, and I write for that project a lot. And we were just chatting about the difference between folks who test positive and the culture around uh, disclosure, like disclo disclosure politics around testing positive for HIV and how the public kind of response is vastly different um, for COVID-19. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I use Twitter a lot and you, you saw especially in, the, in the, the first days of folks testing positive for COVID in the United States, you saw this kind of response, public response um, around disclosing your COVID status, right? People were I, tweeting, I tested positive for COVID-19. And the responses that they received were mostly positive responses. People saying, I, you know, i uh, sending you love. Hopefully, you know, you get the care that you need, what do you need? Um, and so you saw this um, very public kind of um, solidarity from people around people who were testing positive for this new emerging virus, right? And that's vastly different um, for folks who live with HIV, right? I remember after testing positive, the, 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 the angst, the the uh, fear, um, the fear of rejection that I kind of internalized um, every time I had to disclose. And a lot of times those disclosures didn't end in a pretty end. It wasn't a pretty or happy ending. It was, oh, wow, thanks for letting me know we can be friends if it was an intimate kind of um, disclosure. Um, or people would ask you questions or blame you. Like, what did you do? to get this virus, um, who, who did you sleep with, and what kind of sex were you having, and did you use protection, right? Those were the kind of questions that, as a newly paused person, I received. So it is kind of triggering, re-stimulating, when you see the difference between the public response to COVID and the overwhelming response to people living with HIV and AIDS. So I do think there was some, some PTSD um, experienced on my end. And um, in terms of um, the, the question of t the difference in time, I mean, we, we know we're in, in a different world um, than at the point that HIV emerged. Um, but what was also true about that time is 
that, you know, in the 1960s, um, a young black boy in the Midwest, we know it, it, from testing his specimens in the 80s, tested positive for HIV, right? Robert Rayford. And no one really rang the alarm bell because it was one black boy in the Midwest. And so, you know, the report in the 80s of men who were homosexuals um, testing, well, not testing positive, but having symptoms of pneumocystis pneumonia got a different kind of re public response than that one black boy in the Midwest. And I, I'm sure that it was because of the amount of people being symptomatic, but it was also because of the race of the folks who first started to show symptoms of HIV. Um, and so I like to bring, to bring in Robert Rayford's history because it murkies the, the narrative of just this white disease at the beginning or the onset of HIV, right? We know that in places like the Midwest or in DC even, or in Philadelphia, people were struggling with what they would know to be HIV, but because they were not uh, a part of that narrative, they were lost to care, right? So we, we don't know about the many folks who we lost because they didn't even know they had AIDS because that community wasn't being focused on. So I just like to like bring that in to kind of um, disturb the water around the narrative of white gay men being the only folks impacted at the onset of HIV. And if I could, and, and this is kind of a, a separate tangent, but I think is very relevant and very pertinent uh, to a discussion that I had uh, earlier today with a reporter just around health. Um, and, you know, full disclosure, I'm very, uh, health has not been my strong suit. My, my day to day is around land use and affordable housing and, and policy and advocacy in that realm. But um, I also do a lot of activism around uh, the movement that we have currently uh, around Black Lives Matter. Uh, as we know, a lot of the victims of police violence here in San Francisco um, have been killed all but a few blocks from where I live as well, and it happened to afflict us in the Latino community. And the question essentially was around uh, the implicit bias, the biases that exist uh, within medicine, within, uh, within that realm. And it really just occurred to me, and I think it just needs to be stated, that they are very much alive and well in all facets of our society. It's just deeply embedded. And I think this goes to the unfortunate uh, nature of anti-Blackness and colorism that exists. And, and my kind of linkage to it is that I think if we look and dig deep enough, we will find the same level of unfortunate violence that we see uh, through different means in the medical world. Sure, in, in, in policing, it, it manifests itself as you know, uh, unarmed black and brown men dying to police gunfire or being choked. In the, the medical world, I assure you that it may be the decision of who gets a ventilator during the COVID crisis and who doesn't. Um, and the same is to be said about government and about legislators, uh, and except that there it's not an individual who was impacted specifically. It is policy that is created with a, a particular bias, a bias or framework that then impacts uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of, of black and brown lives. And that's been the story of this country. Um, and I think that often because of the anti-blackness, because of the colorism, um, the stories uh, that, was, that was, like, was just mentioned go erased and go unnoticed. And the framework of what we focus on is different. And I, I just wanted to put that out there because it struck me as, as relevant to, to add to the discussion. Great. Hey, John, I wanted to ask you a little follow-up question because, uh, you know, uh, your work in terms of the Mission District Testing Project, and that was both the viral test and the antibody test. Um, it, you know, so that's under an analysis now, and I'm, I presume there's some follow-up. Um, uh, and, and now you're organizing in, which, in the uh, Bayview and in, in, uh, Sunnydale neighbor, neighborhoods, which is are predominantly African-American neighborhoods in San Francisco, I believe there still are. Um, and uh, it, what are the differences there in terms of recruiting and, and participation in, from the community in organizing the trials? You know, um, I, I think that the first thing to start with is, and this is true, I think of most major cities, but particularly true of San Francisco, is every neighborhood is so intimately unique. 
Um, and every few blocks, uh, the identity changes a little bit. Um, you know, here in the Mission District, um, we had, you know, a, a very different starting point, if you will, um, in terms of how Dion, who, who I think jumped off, maybe your computer uh, wigged out again, but uh, as she alluded to, there was the Latino Task Force, which existed and already was a kind of infrastructure, if you will, for community to be able to come together, make decisions and move on things. Um, in the Bayview, it's definitely similar, but very different, uh, or was very different. Um, and I was, you know, I had the good fortune of being uh, involved on the onset with the Bayview, but definitely took a back seat uh, as, you know, this is to be led by the community members on the ground that know their community uh, very well. Um, what I could say for the Mission District is we knew that we were gonna have a lot of uh, reluctant individuals out there for the various reasons that one can imagine. Um, when it comes to our day labor program or our newer arrivals to this community, there is not just a fear of maybe uh, if you're undocumented around public charge, but there's also just a general disconnect, I think, that occurs sometimes with institutions or things that appear to be institutions and yourself. If you feel that you are not connected to it or don't have a way into it or don't understand what is even happening, it's hard for you to be connected. And so in, in this mission study initiative, we were very intentional in, in doing the outreach uh, in terms of a campaigning methodology, if that makes sense. If for many of us that have done campaigns and Dion can attest to this too, it's a very multi-pronged approach, right? You flyer, you leaflet, you have the information that you want to divulge, but then you follow up with door knocking and you engage and you have your folks that are door knocking um, trained in a capacity that exudes cultural competency, that it has them understand the folks that they're interacting with. And because of the rich legacy of organizing that we've had in the mission, we had a lot of organizers that already wanted to just come out and help anyway. Um, and the third piece that odd is just the phone banking um, that you can kind of connect with. But I think for us and just specific to the mission district, we were targeting 5,700 people within this particular census tract. And in just four days of outreach, we were essentially able to turn out 3,000 of them. Um, and I think that speaks to the very intentional form of outreach and what we were communicating in our outreach. Great, yeah, thank you for that. And I know we could talk probably for the whole hour um, <laughs> just about those studies and, and the issues around them. I, I kind of want to like change the subject a little bit and it just occurs to me, you know, uh, depending on, you know, who's watching this either live or in a recording, they may not have a clear understanding of the differences between HIV testing and uh, COVID testing. And uh, when we talk about HIV testing, we're talking, and Dion referred to this, but we're talking about, uh, Dion, hi, welcome back. Um, <laughs> I was just, I was just raising, a, raising your name. Uh, and you had talked about how um, uh, with uh, uh, HIV testing, uh, you're, you're testing for exposure to the virus through by testing the for the uh, uh, presence of antibodies, uh, which of course antibodies are developed in response to the to the virus in the, in, in the system, and uh, and it's a lifelong disease. Whereas with uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. Uh, we're, we're generally, uh, except in research studies, we're generally testing for exposure to the virus, uh, active infection, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, my doctor won't give me the antibody test yet. I'd really like to, like to have it personally because I have a, I have a, a boyfriend who's a, an essential worker, and, uh, but we're just like, now that the viral test is widely available, we just take the test every couple of weeks to try to reduce our uh, levels of uh, risk so that we can spend time together, you know. Um, but I, I really want to direct to bring in Matt and Ernest and, and Tim in particular in, in talking about what, what are the risks um, specifically uh, legally in, uh, for people's civil rights for testing positive to either uh, an active infection with SARS-CoV-2 or to the antibody the funny, uh, I think the funny thing, and this may be wrong, is I think in thinking of it from a standpoint of discrimination, I'm actually 
maybe long-term more worried about people who test negative. Um, and what I mean is that um, if it proves to be the case um, that the infection doesn't have serious long-term consequences, and I know the jury is still out on that, and will be for a long time. And if it also proves to be the case that antibodies give you immunity, and we don't know that either, or a le certain level of immunity. But if it proves to be the case, I think we may well find um, um, society deciding it wants to privilege people um, who've got the antibodies because those people are, are going to be able to um, uh, uh, work and not and, and at least in theory not be shedding virus if they don't get reinfected. Um, so if there's at least a possibility I think that this could work in, in reverse. Yeah, there's kind of a scramble and I think that's why I keep e emailing my doctor at Kaiser saying when can I get the antibody test because I really you know Ironically, I, I'm hoping that I had an asymptomatic case and so that I can, uh, you, know, um, you know, visit my mom who's 84 and, and say, don't worry, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Um, yeah, but even if you do, did have the antibodies, actually, we don't know that right now. And, and the other reason you shouldn't hope that you had an asymptomatic case is there are more and more suggestions there may be some long-term damage done by the virus. And, and that right. would, you know, if either of those things are different, that would take it away. But if both of those things held, if it, if it didn't do a lot of long-term damage most of the time, um, and um, the antibodies uh, gave you effective immunity, I can see people suggesting, you know, that we'll, once you get a positive test, we're going to give you a certificate that will go electronically on your phone, and you can prove to employers or to other people that you don't present a risk of shedding virus because you've already had it. Yeah, so uh, Tim and Ernest, what, you know, when, when I think about I remember to talk about uh, tattooing people with HIV, you know, <laughs> and uh, and and here what we're talking about is basically issuing somebody a card that they could. Flash. I suppose somebody could like uh, um, counterfeit a, a card like that. But uh, you know, what 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 kind of issues does that raise in terms of stigma for people who have one and who don't? We kind of cross the barrier. Of, uh, in this conversation at this point to um, one of like extreme discomfort for me because um, when I think about the rates of morbidity and mortality in the black community of uh, COVID, um, this is a very privileged conversation that we just, that we just embarked on because the assumption is you can, you can contract COVID, you have mild illness, you push through or you're asymptomatic and you push through and you get your certificate or your uh, green bar on your phone and you're good to go. I'm talking about communities in which um, infection um, in very disproportionate ways leads to severe illness, weeks of, uh, in the hospital and death uh, for a good number of those folks who are, hospi who are hospitalized. So um, I, can't, I can't even have these these conversations about the herd immunity uh, framework that Sweden was um, it, it, you know is in the middle of, and the impacts that that's having not in that case on people of color for the most part, although their immigrant population along with their senior population is in fact being decimated, uh, and and that would in fact be the same uh, dynamic that would play out in the U.S. And quite frankly, I know that that would be just fine for a good number of people. People would um, see that as uh, something that was unfortunate, but uh, the price of doing business. Because in fact, as I said earlier, there is a genocidal kind of tone to some of the conversations that are being had related to, um, related to what the, the, the dynamic that is at play in the United States. The fact that the administration, once they um, decided that the daily press conferences were touting uh, madness around uh, light infusions and uh, bleaches and, 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 and uh, disinfectants wasn't working, they've gone silent. <laughs> As um, state after state is seeing the, the highest uptick in new cases, uh, multiple states I've been reading have seen in the last the last week the highest rates of new infections since the beginning of their tracking 
in, uh, in February and March. What does that mean? Um, that the epidemic, that the, the pandemic is exploding at the exact same time that the administration goes silent. For me, it says that they've already kind of calculated in um, the fact that a certain amount of certain people are going to be infected. And that's just, once again, the price of doing business. They are okay with this. Um, and I, I feel uh, that has to be rejected at every level, that that notion that there are people who are whole swaths of the population that are expendable is just completely unacceptable to me. Yeah, and Tim, I, I, I remember um, the feeling, I, I believed it in my core that the Reagan administration was allowing us to die um, uh, as uh, uh, people with HIV and AIDS um, and how tied that was in my mind to homophobia in particular, but certainly racism um, and classism. And uh, do you agree with Ernest that we're experiencing maybe a passive genocide framework here coming from the Trump administration? Very well could. I mean, it felt like that back in the 80s. It, the federal government was willing to let gay people and needle users die. Um, you know, it wasn't until 1986 that the CDC even addressed HIV. Uh, that was five years into the epidemic. I mean, we felt like we were targeted people and we were fighting very hard for our lives. Um, ACT UP came out of that and we couldn't get uh, good research going. Um, you know, the CDC didn't come up with really a full blown campaign until I think 1988. Um, it was, yeah, it was, they were willing to let us go. Uh, you know, we, yeah. So in this, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, coinciding with this, with the Trump administration overlaying over the whole thing, um, it, 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 it really brings that, that, uh, that thinking to my, mind, to my mind, and each of you kind of touched on this, uh, that there are populations that are considered expendable. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, in, the, just the um, varied access to healthcare that pre exists the, uh, the, this pandemic, I think, sort of feeds, uh, feeds that fire. Um, so, and we see a lot of legisla legislating happening also on a, on a federal um, and a state level, but it, most of it's around relief and, and economic relief, it seems to me. Are we going to see more legislation coming uh, to try to uh, accelerate the pace of access uh, to health care for uh, groups that are most impacted by this disease? Um, we'll see one more, at least one more stimulus kind of uh, legislation designed to address the, to the relief to the states and localities that are being uh, hardest impacted by COVID. And then they'll probably be also um, included in that, uh, uh, some support for people who are experiencing significant housing uh, crises, either in um, mortgage and rental payments, uh, relief, stuff like that. Um, we should see some uh, legislation that also addresses food security. SNAP is one of the big programs that was left out of the last uh, relief package that I think most people expect to be a part of this one. But the problem is that the House has passed um, a legislation, piece of legislation that, that tops out at $3.2 billion, and the Senate is saying they only want to spend, excuse me, $3.2 3.2 trillion, and the how the, the Senate is saying they only want to spend a trillion dollars for everything, um, and so that's a really big gap, and there's a lot of need, and it's going to be very <coughs> difficult to square which priorities from the House bill are addressed. The House bill is a very good bill; it's very strong. It has lots of of things that people and and entities across the country need but it's unlikely that um, everything will be addressed in that bill. And as far as healthcare goes, um, you can track almost in a, a direct way, 
the states that did not um, take full advantage of the um, of the Affordable Care Act's ability for them to expand their Medicaid programs. You can track it in an exact way um, to the high rates of STDs, the high rates of HIV, the high rates of um, hypertension, cancers, all kinds of diseases, all the health disparities track on those states that chose not to uh, support health care expansion for their population. This um, disease is tracking exactly the same way. And in, and in counties across the country that are predominantly black, all of those health disparities overlay on top of each other um, in a direct pattern. And so we won't see um, any health uh, expansion legislation until we change the administration and until we change the Senate because they have absolutely no interest in addressing the health of those people, which is exactly the point I was making earlier. Once this became, once it became clear to certain people in power that this, um, that the morbidity and mortality was disproportionately impacting people that they'd already discounted, the, the notion of health expansion went completely off the table. Everything that's being discussed in the, in the Congress is all about either um, relief for business or relief for workers in the context of farm relief or in some instances, uh, housing relief and uh, supports for the very low income so they can pay their rent. You would think you'd be getting a check so that you can pay a business uh, because it's all related to um, business relief. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's uh, actually a good, I just wanna like, um, uh, say we, we only have a few minutes left. I don't see any questions coming from the audience. And so I, and I apologize. I feel like we didn't get into enough depth with uh, any of you really. Um, uh, and there's so much more that we can talk about, but I just want to like go around again and maybe give everybody um, a few minutes, uh, two or three minutes to just talk about, um, well, Matt referred to uh, hope for the future yes. um, in, in, the, in the beginning. Um, but uh, if you don't want to talk about hope um, specifically, maybe you uh, will talk about just how you see this playing out. And Ernest talked about the necessity of changing this administration, really. Uh, a lot of us are just fighting locally or in our neighborhoods right now. Uh, but there's a lot of macro issues going on here. So, we're, so where do you see the hope and how do you see this playing out? And can I start with you, Abdul or Ali or did, would you prefer I go to somebody else? Sure, I can start. I, okay. um, I resonate with what Ernest said earlier, which is that this, uh, this system is actively genocidal. I don't think it's passive. Um, anytime you have a system that puts the knee on the neck of someone kills that person, and then the dead person has to be subjected to trying to convince the living of their humanity, I think that suggests that the system at its root is rotten. Okay. Um, and so I think we can talk about disparity, but we must talk about what causes it. Mm -hmm. And what causes disparity is a racist system what causes disparity is white supremacy and anything that we address anything that we talk about has to be rooted in how are we going to upend that system yes. right um and and i think a visual of how that looks is um over the you know across the united states and globally you see people toppling symbols and iconography of white supremacy right people are beheading Christopher Columbus statues. Um, in Philadelphia, the Rizzo statue was removed and Rizzo was um, anti-black and homophobic and transphobic. Um, he was a mayor of Philadelphia. And so you see this imagery of what, what it means to live today, right? The rage of, of the, the, the constant bombardment of seeing black death, right? the ways in which that's embodied by Black people. Um, 
the, the constant message is that we're either going to die, we're going to be targeted to die, or we're dying, right? The constant reminder that we have to stand and say Black Lives Matter, that's not a question, it's not an invitation, it's a declaration. And I think, um, you know, we're going to, to continue to see the system be challenged. Um, we're going to continue to see uh, people in the streets um, until we stop having the cursory conversation, right? Until we stop saying, oh, well, we can reform this or we can reform that, or this thing needs attention and that thing needs attention. I think until we say this system has to be radically uprooted, um, we can have these conversations and they may be helpful to certain communities, right? We can try to push for legislation, but there must be a framework of considering police abolition, there must be a framework of, of, of actively um, paying reparations to descendants of African people who were stolen. Um, and we must talk about how we have to have health care for everyone, right? Um, and, and that's what I'll say. I think that's Great. for me what is most resonant at the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, John. I feel like you're bursting to say something. That <laughs> <laughs> I'm always bursting to say something, Terry. That's that's the honest truth. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I would say that, um, and again, I have not been alive for that long. I have not been organizing and doing all this for that long. But I have, in the short time, uh, been very exposed to trying to make, you know, things happen. This feels different. This feels uniquely different for all of the reasons that we can all kind of agree to, COVID putting 43 million people out of work, uh, COVID impacting communities of color, uh, primarily the black community with mortality, um, the Latino community with you know, the, the essential working piece and, and contracting. Um, and then we see the police violence of, of four men taking the life of George Floyd with the knee to the neck, very traumatic events. And I think we've, we've circled on this, but it's a point that must be reiterated. All of this is rooted in the, the founding of this country in white supremacy. It is embedded, it is deep within the culture of what America is. It is not new, it is not random, it is what we are. And what I would say is different in this particular moment in history is that people are tired of it. We are actually mm -hmm. seeing people in the streets, days on end, chanting Black Lives Matter. And what I am hopeful for is that this energy, this passion, this anger, this frustration is going to be channeled in doing things like defunding the police as we're hearing chants for the first time. Something that three months ago, people would have looked at you like you were crazy. We have Minneapolis disbanding their police department in some, in some form or another. And we may not all agree on what that means and what that ultimately becomes, but what we can see and what we can acknowledge is that we are over, we are over pretending it's not there. We are over not acknowledging it. And I'm hoping that there is a paradigm shift where we as a country are comfortable enough to acknowledge the racist founding of this country, take ownership of it, and rectify all of these situations. So people like myself can go and retire in Costa Rica and not have to worry about equity. But until we get that, I plan on being on the front lines doing this. And I know everybody around me plans on doing the same thing. We just want what's fair. We want what is owed. And it gives me hope in seeing young organizers bringing 30,000 people into the streets of San Francisco. It gives me hope to see all these people in the streets. So. Um, if, if people are out there listening, all I could really tell you is take action and acknowledge what is being said uh, and do better to make yourself better and, and engage actively to help these things change in the future. Great. Uh, thank you, John. Um, we have uh, a minute left for each of the four panelists if they each talk for one minute. <laughs> well, let me just say, um, I'm more aware than ever that racism is in our DNA as a nation, as a white people. Um, and I'm more hopeful than ever that it's going to be some significant changes in that regard. Uh, I saw the youth march last week that John just made reference to, uh, which was very encouraging. And I'm ready to go where they want me to go. Tell me what to do. 
I'm hopeful. Great, thank you. Um, Ernest? I'm going to go on the hope train with everybody else. That, 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 that sounds great to me. Um, it does feel um, different than most recent uh, engagements, but it feels an awful lot like the 70s, and I remember what happened then, and uh, mm -hmm. the crackdown, the, the blowback wasn't pretty, but, um, you know, I'm hopeful. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dion. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, I think the, the thing that helped drive me in all these years in the HIV work was this formula of uh, understanding at any, go any point in time, what do we know? So what do we know right now about COVID and its disproportionate impact and how it's transmitted and what do we don't know? And are these tests valid? And if you get a positive antibody test, what does it mean? We don't know this. And we lived through that in HIV for years, right? And we had to formulate public policy for years and, and formulate medical care for years in the face of unknown. And so being able for me to bring together the, the best knowledge that we have at any point in history and, and knowing that maybe two months from now, that knowledge will have changed because we will have learned something else. But knowing that, that this is the best that we have right now and then fighting like hell that it's available to everybody, not just to the privileged, not just to those of us who have insurance, but that it's available to everybody and that we understand that there's really different risk factors for people. People are impacted differently and the work has to be done. And the way to do that is in partnership with the communities that really, that, that reflect and that are impacted by these issues. And to me, that's been kind of the, the driving force. Um, I have lots of misgivings about all of our roles in contributing to the severe health disparities that exist in HIV. I take full responsibility for it's, it's the, I understand there's larger forces that created this, but we perpetuated them. All of our institutions, San Francisco General Hospital, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, we all made mistakes and we didn't always know what was the right thing to do. And so we need to come into this work around this pandemic and continue the work with our first pandemic with a lot of humility and really understand that there's a lot to be learned about this larger movement about racial justice and social justice that we are a part of, that we'll be able to continue to rectify the mistakes and the errors that we made. And so, yeah, I have hope. <laughs> Great, thank you, Diane. Uh, Matt, talk to us. Well, um, uh, I'm not giving away a secret here when I say I'm old and I may have aged out of a revolutionary perspective. Um, but, but I buy on to Abdul Ali's uh, agenda. And I think it's an agenda that actually the country can have a conversation about. Reparations, changing our concept of what public safety is, healthcare for all. I think the country's getting close to ready to have those conversations. And I think part of the reason for that is, is that more and more white Americans I think are recognizing that race is, is America's most systemic problem and is at the root of much of what's wrong with the country. And I guess as a parting word on that, that, that change, which is so different to me than the 60s and the 70s, um, um, is really what we need to grasp onto. And so I say three things about grasping on. One, um, don't forget history. Think about the mistakes we made with AIDS and HIV. Think about them in the conceptual sense and try to avoid making uh, the same mm -hmm. mistakes again. I totally buy onto Diane's idea that you come at any problem like this with a lot of humility and a lot of ears. And finally, I'd say, um, you know, in the end, to really, really get something happening on, on those issues, it's a persuasion process. Um, and you need to keep that uppermost when you're thinking both about things that worked in the past and didn't and coming at it with humility. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, so I just wanna thank you all for your time tonight and for your wisdom and your honesty. I, I think we really spoke to a lot of uh, really good uh, issues here and I certainly learned a lot. Um, 
And uh, I think we, we all have a lot to learn and share with others. And, and I'm hoping that this is part of the continuing conversation. Uh, my board member Lito just posted, uh, we got to do a part two. So I hope you all will come back either doing another one of these forums as we learn more. Everything's going to be very different in a couple of months. Um, and it would be really great to sort of touch base again and say, you know, what, what has transpired in the interim. Um, and with that, I just want to like encourage everybody to go to our website. We are a nonprofit. Uh, we represent the full spectrum of the LGBTQ community's history. And uh, it's important that uh, people join in a uh, $35 membership for Pride Month. We have a great Pride page up, just launched today. Check it out, dlbthistory.org. And with that, thank you all very much for all the work that you've done and that you continue to do. And wash your hands. Thank, thank you, Terry. Great meeting you all. Thank you. Take care.